This is LXBN TV, and I'm Colin O'Keefe. The California Supreme Court recently issued an important decision in Brinker v. Superior Court, a prominent case involving meal and rest periods for employees. To break down the case and the ruling, we bring in Thomas Kaufman of Shepard Mullen and their labor and employment law blog. Tom, first off, how did the court arrive at the ruling it did, and what are your thoughts on it? Well, the, the case includes several rulings, but the two main rulings that most of the people were waiting for were questions about how employers meet their obligations under California law to uh, provide meal periods and rest periods to their employees. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, really the court, uh, these are all governed by statutes that set forth certain language about what the employer has to do. Mm -hmm. And the big fight, this, this took uh, almost four years to decide once it got up to the California Supreme Court, and it had been argued about for a couple years before that. But the big fights were, first of all, what does it mean for an employer to provide a meal period? Mm -hmm. uh, the dispute was whether the employer simply has to tell people, you can take a meal period and get out of the way and not, not prevent them from taking one or whether the employer had to go a step further and actually make sure people were taking meal periods so that if somebody worked during a meal period, uh, that would be a violation. That was right. about meal periods. And for rest period, there was a question of how, how much rest time do you have to give people? Mm -hmm. The statute said you have to provide uh, for each four hours worked uh, or major fraction thereof, you have to provide 10 minutes of rest time. And there was a question of what does that mean, major fraction thereof? So the court reached these decisions, I think, by just taking a very common sense, plain meaning approach. Um, it first found that to provide a meal period really means to uh, give employees a chance to take the meal period. The exact language they said was, you have to relieve employees of all duty, mm -hmm. um, you have to give them 30 minutes, and you have to let them leave the premises so they're free to, for 30 minutes, pursue whatever they want to pursue. Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't have to police them and make sure they're not working so that if someone on their own choice decides they want to work, maybe they want to go home sooner or catch up on old work, uh, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And it's only if the employer um, coerces them or pressures them to miss the meal period that the employer is going to have to pay an hour of pay as a, basically a penalty. Um, for the rest periods, they interpreted major fraction as meaning uh, more than half. So if you work more than six hours, you're owed a second rest period. And like the meal periods, the rest periods, the employees can decide not to take them, but you have to give them the chance. Mm -hmm. And I, I think all that was, you know, fair reading of the statute, very common sense. I see. And, and then what, you know, obviously you've touched on this already, but, you know, what what impact does this have on on employers, you know, in California and outside of it? But what you know, what lessons should should, should employers glean from this? Well, the the big uh, the, the, I think the big effect was positive in that you know this notion of having to police your employees and make sure they clock out for thirty minutes every day is very hard for a lot of industries to do in practice. Um, you know, there's people who have uh, drivers who are out on the road who you can't really supervise or you know, for uh, people in the restaurant industry, the employees don't want to take 30 minutes off because they're getting paid tips and they lose their other tips. Yeah. So I think that it was more balancing what industrial realities. But at the same time, you know, you need to have a policy that says the employee is entitled to take this 30 minute period off or is entitled to take the rest periods. And you need to follow it. So if, if the employee can show that they were pressured, or they can come up with evidence that the employer didn't really allow these, they still can recover. It's not just a completely empty right to be able to get your meal and rest breaks. Mm -hmm. And I think the court did a good job of balancing that and coming forth with a test that employers can follow, but you know doesn't necessarily lead to a big boon for plaintiff's lawyers to just bring class actions against every company who's less than perfect in forcing all their employees to take their breaks. Yeah, it, it, I think this came out. Much of the commenters, this was a big, a big victory for employers. You know, just that they don't have to go around just policing people and, and and kind of micromanaging. But you know, also there was another kind of another aspect to this in terms of you know class actions and that type of thing. You know, 
Um, what commentary on the state of class actions uh, did this case provide? You know, it's my understanding that they followed much of what was laid out in the you know popular and much talked about Walmart v. Dukes. Yeah, I mean, basically, so a little background on that. Last year in Dukes v. Walmart, the United States Supreme Court laid out some clarification of the standards for class certification. Uh, and you know, class certification is the step a plaintiff has to go through to turn the case from being for one person to being you know, for a large group. Mm -hmm. The big fight in these cases is over class certification. And in the, in the Walmart case, the Supreme Court emphasized that there's importance that this really can be decided, the case can be decided for this whole group without having to go person by person and have some issue, maybe only one issue, but have some issue that has to be decided person by person. Mm -hmm. uh, before Walmart, there was sort of this issue that as long as the plaintiff could come up with some commonality, like we all worked in the same job, a court was free to certify the class. And Walmart said, no, you need to respect the defendant's right to raise its individual defenses where they have them. And no California, the California Supreme Court had not decided whether they were going to adopt that as a standard of California law as well. There was a case that came out a couple of weeks before called Duran that seemed to accept Walmart, but that's not a Supreme Court case. That was only at the appellate level, and the Supreme Court could still take that one out. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in, this, in this case, the, the court didn't expressly say, we adopt Walmart, but all of their analysis was consistent. They actually cited to a law review article by a guy named Professor Richard Nagareda, who was the intellectual source of much of Walmart's rulings. Mm -hmm. And the ruling they made in the case that the one of the issues in the case for Brinker was, could an off-the-clock case be certified? Uh, they said it couldn't be because it required, you know, the policy said you, you can't work off the clock, and it would require a person-by-person -person analysis to see if people did. And that's a good sign that Walmart is going to be adopted by California as well. So I think most of the people who looked at the case thought that the defense won on that issue and that it bodes well for uh, fighting class certification. Very interesting. Yeah, this is a very, it's a much talked about case, very important for employers, very important for, for what's going on in the class action sphere of the law. So it's going to be interesting to see what impact this has going forward on the, both of those two things. Um, once again, that was Thomas Kaufman of Shepard Mullen and the Labor, Empo Labor and Employment Law Blog. Excuse me. For more on the story, visit their publication. It's at www.laboremploymentlawblog.com. And of course, lxbn.lexblog.com. We have a ton of posts on this. Uh, run a search for Brinker, hit the tag, and you'll find a number of posts on the subject. Well, thanks, Thomas. This was great. Thank you very much.